Welcome to WHRO's Weekly Edition. I'm Doug Boynton. In this week's program, how do you keep the kids at home? There are some people working on that. A fighter pilot based at Oceana is the first woman to score a kill in air-to-air combat. And the whole presidential race has been turned upside down. WHRO's Michelle Hankerson has a chat with a Virginia Beach delegate who's headed for next month's Democratic convention. You know, this this wasn't going to be about the accomplishments. Sometimes the, the visuals of uh, overtake the accomplishments. But first, this news update from NPR. It's WHRO's Weekly Edition. Declare victory and head home. The Gaza Pier mission, staffed by local soldiers, is expected to wrap up as the military prepares to use a different way to deliver food and other supplies to Gaza. WHRO military reporter Steve Walsh has the story. The Pentagon announced this week that the U.S. is shutting down the effort to deliver humanitarian aid to Gaza using its troubled floating pier. Soldiers from the 7th Transportation Brigade are expected to remain in the region to deliver the last 5 million pounds of aid to the port of Ashad in Israel, says Pentagon spokeswoman Sabrina Singh. We want to make sure that aid is going to continue to flow into Gaza, um, but this new route that aid flows through Ashdod will ultimately be managed by USAID and other humanitarian organizations. Roughly 500 soldiers left Langley, Houston in March to make the one-month-long trip to Gaza. The Pentagon says the pier delivered 20 million pounds of aid to people facing starvation. Steve Walsh, WHRO News. How to keep young workers in Hampton Roads. There are some people working on that. WHRO's Ryan Murphy has the latest. Data shows the region is losing young professionals and recent college graduates to areas like Raleigh at alarming rates. A lot of what we want to try to do is use this out migration data and understand the why people have been leaving. But more importantly, how do we solve for it? That's Nancy Gurdon from the Hampton Roads Executive Roundtable, which recently commissioned a study of the problem. The report flags affordability, availability of housing and health care, a lack of job opportunities, and perceptions of safety as the biggest things pushing people away from Hampton Roads. Gurdon says those leaving are mostly non-military workers who moved here as adults and don't have kids. But a different group could be key to tackling the issue. Boomerangers are people who grew up here, left, came back. Those boomerangers often return because of family ties, but many also say the cost of living here is part of the reason they returned. Ryan Murphy, WHRO News. William & Mary has received its largest ever donation in order to expand a school devoted to marine science. We get details from WHRO's Catherine Hafner. The school will now be called the Batten School of Coastal and Marine Sciences, after local philanthropist Jane Batten, who gave $100 million. University President Catherine Rowe says about half will go to programming, including hiring lots of faculty. What this gift does is allow us very rapidly to expand the degree programs in a way that would just have gone much more slowly without teaching and research faculty to support a much larger group of students. They'll use the rest to transform the existing campus at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. A key piece of the expansion is a new undergraduate marine science degree the school hopes to launch next fall. They'll first need state approval. Catherine Hafner, WHRO News. And we should mention Jane Batten is also a financial supporter of WHRO. How are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen, well, you know. Two athletes with ties to Chesapeake are traveling to Paris this month to compete in the 2024 Olympics. Details from WHRO's Nash Phillips. One of the headliners for the 2024 track and field team, Chesapeake native Grant Holloway, is returning for his second Olympic Games. The former world champion and Grassfield High School graduate won a silver medal in the 110-meter hurdles at the 2021 Games. He told WTKR in 2021 he's eager to build upon that mark. You know, that just gives me momentum and something to strive for for the future. Of course, having the silver medal is going to make me work a little bit harder this offseason. Viral high school phenom, 16-year-old Quincy Wilson also hails from Chesapeake. He's the youngest ever athlete to make the USA men's track and field team and holds the under-18 world record in the 400-meter dash. Wilson attended Great Bridge Middle School before relocating for high school. 
and used to train with Holloway's father, Stan. Nash Phillips, WHRO News. It's a new $19 million police station for Williamsburg, and it wasn't exactly a groundbreaking, it was a beam signing. WHRO's Nick McNamara was there. Williamsburg Police Chief Sean Dunn is looking forward to the department's new building, one he says will meet the needs of a 21st century police force. He was joined by Mayor Doug Pons and state officials to autograph a key support beam for the building. This facility will serve our community for 40 years, maybe even more, so it really is a proud day for us. Williamsburg Police have been housed in their current building since the late 70s. The new building will include dedicated reporting rooms for victims, an officer fitness room, and a community meeting space. The station is expected to be completed in the fall of 2025. Nick McNamara, WHRO News. The shoreline south of the James River Bridge may look a bit different over the next few years. The Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources has been awarded an $8 million grant to support a shoreline protection project at Ragged Island Wildlife Management Area in Isle of Wight County. Nearly 300 feet of shoreline has been lost since the late 1930s. If you're crossing the James River Bridge from Newport News to Isle of Wight, the area involved is off to the left. Christopher Newport University and the Ducks Unlimited Conservation Group are also involved in the project. In 2019, the Space Force became the nation's first new military branch in nearly 80 years. Now Congress is already thinking about starting another one. And as Jay Price reports for the American Homefront Project, the new branch's domain would not be physical. Here's a hint. That's what a new cyber force would sound like in battle. There's been talk of creating a cyber force for years. The annual defense policy bills being considered by the Senate and House call for a study into the idea, though it's unclear whether that study will make it into the final legislation. Already, the existing service branches have thousands of cyber operators, like the one at this keyboard. So right now I'm configuring the Operation Tobacco Road cyber exercise. Specialist Isaac Marshall is a soldier at the North Carolina National National Guard Cybersecurity Response Force. His team looks for vulnerabilities in state and local government computer networks. On a recent day, he was preparing a training event to help government IT workers recognize and respond to attacks. This is the simulated internet that the red teams will be using to attack the blue teams. The military's current structure for cyber is complicated. Each service branch has its own cyber units, while the Pentagon's overarching U.S. Cyber Command relies on teams teams of troops on loan from the branches. Backers of a new cyber force say it could fix ongoing organizational and staffing problems that are partly due to having troops who are recruited by different services. Every other domain has a force tailored to its needs. Emily Harding is with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. There's a Navy that really understands how to operate on and under the water. There's an Air Force that really understands how to operate in the air. There's now a Space Force that understands how space operates as a separate domain. There is no force directed at cyber. The military has struggled with recruiting in recent years, partly because many young Americans don't meet the physical requirements. Harding says a separate cyber force could set its own standards. The cadre of people you might want to hire for a cyber force might not necessarily need to meet the same physical specifications. And that can be physical fitness, but it can also be just appearance. Some, for example, may want to sport a wild hairstyle or not shave or put on a uniform every day. And that really should be okay. There's room for that in a cyber force where there wouldn't be in, say, the Marine Corps. Harding says a cyber force could also address recruiting challenges by relying largely on part-time reserve troops, like some of the cyber operators inside the North Carolina National Guard's heavily secured headquarters. Guardsmen and reservists can continue to work full-time private sector jobs in the high-paying tech industry while getting advanced training and government benefits through their military duties. Lieutenant Colonel Seth Barron is chief of cyber operations for the North Carolina Guard. There's a lot of people that want to do cyber. There's so many that I don't even have enough slots to put them all into. 
Some see risk in creating a new cyber service. Vanderbilt University professor Charlie Moore is a retired Air Force lieutenant general and is a former deputy commander of U.S. Cyber Command. He says it would be too disruptive to shift around the military's cyber experts. We're in a state of persistent engagement with our adversaries in cyberspace. And the threats are too great right now and the costs are too high for us to lose focus on what's going on inside the domain at the current moment. Moore says some recent changes will help Cyber Command address organizational issues without creating a whole new branch. And he's confident the command and the individual services can address the recruiting issues together. That's a much easier fix than standing up an individual service. Experts on both sides of the argument say regardless of whether Congress eventually decides to create a cyber force, each of the existing services will still have specific needs they have to handle themselves. The cyber needs for a submarine, for example, are substantially different from those for a fighter jet or tank. So the branches would all need to retain at least some cyber specialists of their own. I'm Jay Price reporting. The Navy says a Virginia Beach-based pilot from the USS Eisenhower became the first U.S. woman to engage in air-to-air combat. WHRO military reporter Steve Walsh has the story. The F-18 pilot shot down a drone using an air-to-air missile during a mission to protect international shipping against attacks from Houthi rebels in Yemen. The pilot became the first American woman to engage in air-to-air combat since all combat positions in the military were open to women in 2015. The Navy has released few details, including her name and when the attack took place. She was a member of the air crew for the USS Eisenhower Strike Group based in Norfolk, which was in the Red Sea for seven months. Her unit, the Fighting Swordsman, fired 20 missiles against drones during the deployment. The swordsman flew more than 3,000 combat hours and 1,500 combat missions as part of the busiest deployment for an aircraft carrier since World War II. Steve Walsh, WHRO News. Cat welfare advocates in Hampton have launched a new website calling for the city to change how it handles stray and feral cats. That story from WHRO's Nick McNamara. SaveHamptonCats.org was created by a coalition of animal welfare organizations. They want to see an end to full-time cat trapping by the city of Hampton, which they say results in cats ending up in shelters that may euthanize them. Here's Cat Corner Incorporated President Tiffany Young. The system's broken, and we all need to work together. The shelter, animal control, the other nonprofits like ourselves and other groups that want to all help the animals just need to work together and come up with a better solution that's not broken. Young also wants wants to see more resources for sterilizing free-roaming cats and an easier process for registering feral colonies with the city. Nick McNamara, WHRO News. Construction is officially underway on a controversial pipeline expansion in Hampton Roads. WHRO's Catherine Hafner has the details. Canadian company TC Energy told federal regulators that construction started this week on what's called the Virginia Reliability Project. It will replace and double the size of about 49 miles of an existing natural gas pipeline. Local officials say the project is needed to support growing energy demand and replace outdated infrastructure, but environmental groups have fought it throughout the permitting process. They oppose continued investment in fossil fuel infrastructure that contributes to climate change. TC Energy expects to have the updated pipeline running by late next year. Catherine Hafner, WHRO News. A new group is trying to make economic development more of a regional effort by pooling money from Hampton Roads cities and counties. WHRO's Ryan Murphy has the details. If you wanted to start a restaurant but didn't have the cash, you may look for investors to put in money up front for a cut of the profits later. Jim Noel says that's the same idea behind the Eastern Virginia Regional Industrial Facility Authority. We got together, those six localities decided how much each one wanted to invest in this project, and then that's a direct pro rata return for what they invested. So if you invested 20%, you get 20% of the returns. Noel, a longtime economic development director from York County, now runs the regional group. Five cities and counties on the peninsula, along with Isle of Wight, put money towards E.V. Riffa's first project in York County. 
There are now plans for a Dominion solar farm and a 31-acre warehouse project there. Noel says this kind of effort makes Hampton Roads more attractive to businesses and helps localities that don't have the space for big projects to get in on larger-scale development. Ryan Murphy, WHRO News. This is WHRO's Weekly Edition. Remember, for any stories you've missed, you can visit us on the WHRO smartphone app or all social media platforms. Now that Kamala Harris seems poised to get the Democratic nomination for president, how does she poll in Virginia? Virginia Public Radio's Michael Pope looks at the numbers. Before Joe Biden dropped out of the race for president, several polls took a look at how Kamala Harris would do against Donald Trump in a head-to-head matchup in Virginia. J. Miles Coleman at the UVA Center for Politics says the polls present a mixed picture. The New York Times released a poll of Virginia recently, and Biden was up three. Harris was up by closer to five points, so a little better. But in some of the other Virginia polls recently, I know the Emerson one and the VCU one, she was about exactly the same as Biden. Mark Rosell is dean of the Schar School at George Mason University, and he says any Democrat running against Trump would probably fare as well as Biden, if not marginally better. And he says that could win the election. Marginally better could be the difference in this election cycle, since we're looking at a handful or more states that are competitive in the Electoral College, and some suggest Virginia may be in that column right now. A marginal difference in closely contested states could be the difference. Senator Tim Kaine told reporters Monday morning that Virginia will be a battleground state in 2024. And he added, that's good for Virginia because it'll highlight issues and candidates that matter to voters here in the Commonwealth. I'm Michael Pope. Virginia Beach Delegate Michael Feggins is one of 119 Virginia Democrats expected to anoint Harris as the party's presidential nominee at the Democratic National Convention next month. He spoke with WHRO's Michelle Hankerson. Fagan says he understands why President Joe Biden decided to end his race and endorse Vice President Kamala Harris. You know, this this wasn't going to be about the accomplishments. Sometimes the, the visuals of uh, overtake the accomplishments. Fagan says Biden's underwhelming performance in polling was one of the reasons it made sense for him to step aside. According to a recent Virginia Commonwealth University poll, Biden's approval rating in the state was about 36 percent, three percentage points lower than opponent Donald Trump. In national polls, Harris is about the same, but Fagan's is still excited to see her emerge as the frontrunner for the party nomination. Someone who can become the, the first woman, the first black woman, the first woman of, of, of South Asian descent to be the leader of the free world. Someone who graduated from an historically black college. Someone who's a member of the Divine Nine. It shows a lot of hope for so many. Fagan says come November, Virginia voters will consider how the next president will handle climate change, reproductive rights, and future appointments to the Supreme Court. Michelle Hankerson, WHRO News. North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper talked about reports that he could become Vice President Kamala Harris's running mate. As WUNC's Colin Campbell reports, he's one of several governors mentioned as possible VP candidates. Several leading Democrats in North Carolina have said they'd like to see Governor Cooper on the presidential ticket. He's received more votes than presidential candidates in his two runs for governor, and that could help Harris turn North Carolina blue for the first time since 2008. But speaking Monday morning on MSNBC, the governor said it's premature to talk about Harris's running mate. Well, I appreciate people talking about me, but I think the focus right now needs to be on her this week. And she needs to concentrate on making sure that she secures this nomination and gets the campaign ready to go. Cooper has endorsed Harris to be the Democratic nominee. The two have been friends for years, dating back to their time as state attorneys general. Much of North Carolina remains in drought due to record heat and a lack of rain over the last month. More on that from Bradley George at partner station WUNC. The operation will turn 212 acres into borrow pits, where sand is extracted for construction projects. The southern portion of the property is within the Southern Key Conservation Site, a natural heritage site and the last natural stand of longleaf pine in the Commonwealth. 
Suffolk City staff recommended denying the request, but council opted to permit the operation after hearing the developer's reclamation plans. Council member Timothy Johnson. It is a beautiful site, though. There's lots of unique things there, but there's going to be unique things in all the land we have on that end of the city. Those plans include creating lakes and a wetland mitigation bank on the southern end of the property. Nick McNamara, WHRO News. Governor Glenn Youngkin is putting together an energy plan for Virginia. Michael Pope has the preview. All of the above. That's the approach Governor Glenn Youngkin is expected to take in his energy plan, which is expected this fall. That includes wind and solar, but also nuclear energy and fossil fuels. The governor's energy plan, which is, you know, essentially anything and everything, is reckless, it's expensive, and it's irresponsible. That's Tim Sawinski at the Virginia chapter of the Sierra Club. We can't afford to keep these projects online because one, they're bad for our health, they're bad for our future, and they're bad for our pocketbooks because they're extremely expensive to keep online. Thomas Turner is state director for Conservatives for Clean Energy Virginia, and he says Virginia needs to continue using fossil fuels for now during the transition to renewable energy. We're seeing more and more conservatives starting to realize that having a broader platform of alternative energy is beneficial to not only our grid, but to also ensure that we're not depending on our enemies for foreign oil. Or even now we're talking about critical minerals. He says he expects the governor's plan to embrace more nuclear energy in the form of small modular reactors, which critics call an untested and unproven technology pushed by special interest groups. Uh, Michael Pope. This week marked the 99th Chincoteague Island Pony Swim. WHRO's Connor Worley took a trip up the eastern shore to learn about why this event means so much to so many people. People from all walks of life have descended on Chincoteague. It's the afternoon, a later swim than usual. And despite the rainy, marshy conditions, folks camped out in lawn chairs and blankets draped in ponchos and raincoats. Why does this yearly tradition attract a crowd in the thousands? And more so, why do people care about some ponies swimming? For William Crone, it's his first time at the event. He trekked to Chincoteague all the way from Ontario, Canada. He says the old-fashioned nature of the event is what makes it so magical. It's just a callback to older times that were simpler and easier, and it's wild animals as well, right? So everyone loves wild animals. The Coast Guard lit the flare and the swim began. It was a sight that Sean Kirby couldn't believe. She, her husband, and friends all made the trip from Ohio for their first glimpse of the ponies. I couldn't believe we were up right along the fence. She says this is such a unique event that it's no surprise people flock from all over. Nowhere else do they swim ponies across and then they they sell some of them off so that the herd doesn't get so big. It's just, I think it's awesome. As the final pony reached its destination, the dreary clouds parted and the sun beamed onto the animals as if to signal another successful swim. Connor Worley, WHRO News. You've been listening to WHRO's Weekly Edition. We had help today from Steve Walsh, Ryan Murphy, Nash Phillips, Michelle Hankerson, Nick McNamara, and Catherine Hafner. VPR's Michael Pope and Jay Price with the American Homefront Project. Also thanks to Connor Worley, who produced today's show and took a trip up the eastern shore. A reminder, you can always catch full episodes on the weekly edition podcast feed, and you can get your news updates at whro.org, the WHRO smartphone app, and the WHRO Reports podcast feed. For all of us at WHRO and WHRV, I'm Doug Boynton. Stay safe. Be well.